hope you're doing well. Um, I am here today with uh, Lilo Bowman, and she has written a book that I think we are going to be super interested in. I've talked a little bit about it inside the membership, but her book is called Love Your Creative Space. And this uh, conversation that we're going to have today with Lilo is really to talk about some of those storage challenges, uh, space challenges in our studios and our creative spaces. Because as I've said before, I think our creative space should be a sanctuary, not a storage room. So let's figure out some good tips with Lilo on how uh, we can sort of make that happen. Thanks for joining me, Lilo. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I absolutely agree with you that life is so busy and there's so many stresses, you know, work, family, what have you. And when you come into your studio, it should be a place that's not stressful, that's not making you feel overwhelmed and have anxiety. And, and so uh, I am happy to share a number of different ideas about ways that maybe we can help bring a little bit of that calm into your space that may not currently be in that state. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. So tell me um, your journey to writing this book. Well, I work for thequiltshow.com, which is an online quilting magazine and television show. And uh, for a while there, um, I was asked to put together programs that would appeal to a broad range of makers because a lot of makers quilt, they knit, they paint, they do a whole uh, mixed media. And so the biggest thing that I was hearing from people that I have met over the years working at the quilt show is how they really struggle with dealing with everything in their studio. And so I thought, okay, well, this sounds like a great thing we can do. It was a weekly program. Let's organize your studio. And every week we focused on a different area. And some of them were the, the obvious, you know, big stuff like fabric and batting and um, books um, notions. And then we got into some really sort of different things that I don't necessarily work in, like people who do lots of embroidery with beading and embellishments. And so we went through that week by week, trying to cover most things that we felt that uh, people were dealing with. And at the end of that year, then my boss said, okay, well, what's the next thing you've got going on? So I moved on to another project, was deep in that. And about two years later, I got approached by CNT. Uh, was I interested in writing a book about organizing your space? So that led to this book coming into fruition. I based a lot of what went into the book on what I did in the yearly blog, I mean, in the weekly blog. But then I also decided that there were some areas that, um, that I wanted to expand in. So it was built on the foundation, but then obviously morphed into something much greater. Uh, and so that's how the book came out or came to be. And I've had really a lot of positive feedback from it because it is a guide to give you ideas. It's not a step-by-step, -step, here's how we do this, then we're gonna walk through that area. It's really kind of looking at all the things that you might have to contend with and some options of what you can do in right. your space. Yeah, because yeah, everybody's needs for their space is different and everybody's space is different. Absolutely. I mean. My space has changed every time I've moved and I've moved a great deal because we were in the military. So every two to three years, I never knew what my new space was going to be size wise. And uh, so I had to be really flexible. Other people are really lucky. They're in a nice big space for many, many years. And then there are folks who have to be in a space that's like in a, you know, a shared bedroom or a um, dining room table. Right, dining room table, or maybe not even that, maybe the laundry room. That is the space that's available to you. So um, as you said, it really isn't a one size fits all solution for everyone. You just kind of have to figure out where can I work and how can I make this work with what I've got? Yeah, right. I know I worked um, on our dining room table for many years, and then uh, we moved into um, a house in Seattle that had a guest bedroom 
And I went to visit my mom in North Carolina for a week and I came back and my husband had cleared it out, repainted it and said, this is your new space, which was great. I, I worked in that space for probably five, six years. Um, it was a small bedroom and I make, you know, quilts. So you make the space work. And then I um, moved to our uh, shared finished basement. His business was on one side of the basement with his and his bicycles and mine was on the other side. And, you know, that was a big space. It was very dark uh, in Seattle in a basement. And I managed to, you know, just add lights that worked for me and um, managed to fill it up with a lot of stuff. It, you know, I, I, I can fill up a space with supplies you know, just like the best of them. And so I've been, you know, so interested in this whole process of just figuring out what's important to you in your space and figuring out how to make your space work and things like that. So now we are in Santa Fe. We bought a tiny house, not a, not literally a tiny house, but a small house. We downsized before we came, we got rid of about two thirds of all of the extraneous things that, you know, we had been hanging on to for years. And um, we built this studio that I'm in now. So the reward after 20 years is that I know what works for me. And so I can set this up and it was designed from the ground up um, to work for what I need it for. But we all, you know, have to take steps along the way to get there. It's always a process. So um, I think you're absolutely right. We have to make every space we have work. And and honestly, over the 20 or 30 plus years that you've been working, your style has changed. Maybe the kinds of things that you're working with have changed. And so uh, what often happens is that, you know, because obviously you and I have moved a number of times. So then we have to look at all the stuff that we've accumulated. Right. which definitely then gives you an idea of, oh, I don't really like this anymore and this isn't working for me. But let's say you're in a space and you've been there for the last 25 years. And so over that time, what happens is there are trends, there are things that are in fashion, there are things that you're really excited about and you're really able to do. And then life changes and moves along and then there are new trends and new fashions and now you're working in something new. But guess what? You're still storing all that stuff from 25 years ago. Stuff, yeah. And and it's really hard to find space for all that new new stuff you're excited about right now that you're working in right now. Because guess who's hogging all the room in the, in the cupboard, in the closet, under the bed, wherever you're putting all your things. It's all the stuff that you've had for the last 20, 25 years or more. And so my suggestion is that you at some point, put a date on the calendar and decide I'm going to spend, you know, two or three days and I'm going to go through an area that's really bothering me. You don't have to do the entire place, but let's say it's your closet where you have stored all your fabric for the last 25 years. And it's really difficult to, first of all, see all the things that you have because you're constantly digging through bags and stacks of things here and there is to set aside a time where you can pull all that fabric out. And the idea with that is when you look at your whole collection, you can really see what you have and then also really go through and determine, you know, do I still like working with all this fabric? Let's say for example, you had children in your life. They were made me yours or you had little people that you were making quilts for. And so you have all kinds of fabric that's really sort of kid friendly. Well, all those people have grown up, they're now off and doing something else. And you haven't looked at kid fabric or made anything with kid fabric in 15 or 20 years. That's a great example of some fabric that can go to somebody else. Maybe right. you know somebody that has little people in their life, um, grandkids, nieces and nephews. Um, you can pass that on. Um, maybe you were doing lots of, you know, cross stitch and needlepoint and things that require great um, uh, visual uh, opportunity. And as we age, we all have glasses and our eyesight changes and doing all that really minute, fine needlework, um, let's say whatever it is, 
might be really difficult for you and you and you're saying yeah that's not for me anymore i don't have a, the capacity to do it or i'm not interested in that's another thing that can move on to somebody else pass it on to another area and then what happens is as you're going through this stash of fabric or yarn or whatever it is that's really bothering you is that the idea is that you're cleaning things out which opens up space which allows for those things that you're working in right now that you're really excited about doing. Um, the other thing is that um, we, in general, as makers, have more fabric than we will ever to say that. <laughs> in our lifetime. I mean, <laughs> there are very few people that I have met over the course of 15 years in this industry that really keep it to what they are working with. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's another thing is that there's always some new something coming out. It's really pretty, it catches your eye and you bring it in, but there's not, there's a lot of things coming in, but there's not much going out either as a finished product, um, as a gift, as something that you're saying, okay, and this is no longer exciting for me, I'm gonna pass it on to somebody else. And so that's another thing that we all struggle with. I don't care if your room is a five by seven or whether you've got a two car garage, as you said, you're gonna fill it up. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things that everybody struggles with. Yeah, yeah. And well, and what I find um, along that point is that uh, some, you know, as quilters, we often have designers that we love, fabric designers that we, yes. you know, K-Facet, we want every new collection that they have. And, um, you know, I, as a quilt designer, make very scrappy quilts. Um, and somebody inside of my membership was asking, we were talking about um, fabric storage and cutting pieces for this block of the bunt that we're making. And two different people had commented that they have some collections of uh, fabric from designers that they love uh, and they store them together. Like, a, like if a new release comes out, they'll get the fat quarters set and they'll keep them together. Yep. And there is this um, creative block against breaking that uh, group of fabric. Have you ever heard of that before? I mean, I started thinking about it and maybe, you know, years ago, I may have felt that way, maybe with my first Amy Butler collection of, you know, fat quarters, but what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you have any, I, any uh, pointers to how encourage them that it's okay to dip into that and take out one or two if you need it, if it's the right kind. Yeah, okay. and I, I do know that there that is hard to do, um, to take that wonderful collection that's been wrapped up in a ribbon. And, and, and so what, maybe what you wanna do is just set it out for a bit and live with it. And that way you can pet it every day and look at it. Um, or maybe you just wanna have it as display and you're never going to use it. But if you're going to collect multiples again of, collections is the purpose that you're a collector or that you're a maker and Ooh, so, that's good I like that yeah yes so um I I tend to try to just I I have it for a while and I enjoy it and I look at it but then I'm for me it's fair game I'm gonna I'm gonna work with it yeah. um but you know saying that you're getting it because you're gonna make something and then and then having a hard time with that really means that you're more in the mindset at this point that you're a collector. Collector. You love this collection and you love looking at it and you'll have it there for a while, but then at some point, don't you want to maybe use it because you yeah. found a pattern that you really enjoy and you love this particular designers like K for Tula or any of the other ones that are out there and use some of some of the pieces of it. Maybe not all of it, maybe just take a few little bits from it. Yeah. You still fold it up and put it back and put it in your stack. So right. um, maybe just little bits at a time to kind of get you get you past that that um, standing on the edge of the cliff. Oh no, I've cut into this. Kind yeah, of. yeah, I agree. And that's kind of what I told them. You know, it's like the smallest pieces in the block of the month that we're doing. Um, I said try cutting just those, and you know, out of right. one or two. Uh, because there are collections that I love the whole collection as well too. I'm I'm totally um, guilty of that. 
But the difference is, is that I look at it now from a different perspective as a quilt designer. And even though there may be cave prints that I love, I don't necessarily as a designer have a desire to make a cave quilt. So I wouldn't use all of his fabrics in um, a quilt. However, some quilters would love to make a cave quilt. And so, you know, my thoughts were, if you have a set of fat quarters that you love, that you just can't bear to split up, I guarantee you, if you go ahead and make a quilt with all of them together, find the right pattern and just jump in and do it, you will never regret cutting all that fabric because you'll have it out. You'll have it in your life every day. It's a tangible up. thing. Absolutely. Yeah. It will be maybe yeah. your favorite um, um, throw that you sit under when you're doing handwork or you're yeah. watching TV. And um, and so having it as, as you said, as a tangible thing that you can really enjoy is a very different feeling than having it in the closet or on the shelf and you're looking at it as a precious item that you're afraid to touch. it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, um, yeah, I love that. I think that we, I think that we as quilters, um, another thing that I was thinking about is I think that when we have a large fabric stash, it's almost like um, it's an affirmation to us and to the people around us. I have the skills, I have the talent to use all of this um, fabric, you know, in a quilt or something like that. And um, that's a mindset shift too, I think. It, it like is. I all that fabric to prove to the world that you're a quilt maker. Hmm. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of, of that, uh, in that sense. Um, my biggest thing was I came from a background as being a garment maker. And so for garment making, I bought for each project. I didn't just buy fabric to have yeah. it necessarily. I mean, occasionally I would, there would be something I just couldn't pass up. And I would think I have no idea what I'm making with it, but I love this and I'm going to, I'm going to get it. And so transitioning over to quilting many years ago was a, a, just a revelation to me that, oh, well, you need, you just need to get some fabric because then you can use it. But I loved how quilters, uh, the teachers that I listened to were saying, okay, so if you're going to, if you need orange, you don't want to just have five orange, you want to have 15 and 15 <laughs> is good. And then maybe even 25 is better because you get so many so much different interest with the different oranges or, or the fabric yeah choice that you made and and so i then i realized oh okay now i get why people buy fabric that they don't necessarily have a plan for yeah um so maybe to avoid having too much like you said maybe you just buy fat quarters mm -hmm. which are not too big they're not a huge investment and they don't take up too much space and so that allows you to, whether you're a, a piecer and you like traditional kind of work, you can get lots of little bits out of a fat quarter. You can get a really pretty sizable piece if you're not a, um, a traditional quilter out of a fat quarter. So you can still play a lot with that collection of fabric or that style that you really like. Um, I have some fabric that I've had since we were in Japan in 2003, we left 2003. And that is stuff that I, I, and I normally don't keep lots of little bits, but I keep that because it's something I can't have easy access to. And I, if I'm going to make something out of it, it's going to be something I really want to make. It's right. going to be a special project. It's not, right. I just need to make some pot holders. So I'm going to right. use Japanese fabric. So that's another way that you can maybe look at that collection is whatever you are going to make out of this collection that you really like make it something that's really going to be special to you not just some random tote bag let's say unless right. you really love tote bags and you right. you're taking it off right. um make it something really that you're going to love and you're going yeah, to yeah that's happy. great yeah i love that i love that and you're right it's like as quilters when we are looking at a project we like there's comfort knowing we have options right at our fingertips yep um what I thought was interesting uh, is when uh, the pandemic really locked us down in 2020, 
a lot of people um, really didn't have the option of finding a uh, new fabric easily for a project, but yet they had all this time to sew or more time than they normally had. And so they did go to their stash and yeah. it was a mindset shift. And some people got really um, sort of re-inspired to look at their stash. Some people were so happy when, when businesses <laughs> opened back up, oh, I need to buy more fabric. Um, so it's funny, there's now this, uh, I think there is this uh, group of us who definitely look at our stash a little more critically. We realize how much we have. We realize that there's a limit to how fast we can sew with all of that. Mm -hmm. So people are looking uh, for ways to store it in a smart way and uh, be able to see it and use it too, I think, which is, um, you know, it's the eternal challenge with our creative spaces. Yeah. And the other thing that I um, think people struggle with, and the reason I say that is because I struggled with this before I made a mindset shift back in 2018 to redo how I store things in my studio is um, stacking stuff. You know, uh, our studios become sort of where we stack things that we're gonna get to. And if you're not careful, you're, it can it can become a stack of more than just pretty fabric to sew with. It can become bills and things like that. I mean, even now in my studio, if I leave something um, in the main house that needs to be addressed too long, when my husband is tidying up, I'll find a stack of stuff in my chair. <laughs> so well, I'm like, I got it. I know. <laughs> so somebody's monitoring you. Yeah. Uh, and that, and that is an, something else that a lot of us as humans just do. If there is a flat surface, we are going to put something on it. Yeah. And, uh, and so learning to not always think of all my storage needs to be on a flat surface. Yeah. Think of the idea of vertical space. There is a lot of vertical space in our, in our rooms, on our, uh, in our house. Um, and so looking at ways to store some of the things that you have, um, the front and the back of a door. If you don't like looking at having the door open, you can just do the back of the door. And when you have the door open, you can't see what's on the back of the door. Yeah. Um, I, I happen to have in my studio, I have, it's a, it's a, it's a bedroom at the front of the house. And the reason I chose it was because it had the best light in, in the whole house. And, um, and it has this, I won't call it a walk-in closet, but it has a, a closet that the doors open, uh, that are double doors and they open out. And originally I was gonna take those doors off, uh, but then I decided, no, they're solid. And what I could do is on the inside of the doors, I could hang things mm -hmm. because I don't like looking at all of my supplies and all of my fabric and tools and all that. I, for me, having all of that visual is really, um, stressful so I like something behind a cabinet in a drawer I'll have some things out but but mostly it's all put away and so I use the inside of those closet doors and I hung several different kinds of storage containers one of them is actually a uh, a pantry storage container that you're supposed to hang I don't know packets of ketchup and noodles and what have you and we just mounted it on the inside of the cabinet and I've got all these various baskets and I have several that hold all my tall skinny things like freezer paper or rolls of stabilizer or things that are like tall and narrow that are really hard to have a place for without them falling over. And I didn't want them in the room in a bucket on the floor. Um, and so I have that. I also idea. Have, on the other side, I have baskets that I've mounted with command hooks, zip ties, and uh, just um, office supply baskets that hold all of my cone thread for my serger. I have all my packets of stabilizer, other kinds of random things that I just really don't have room for in my studio open space. So the inside of those doors, I decided really came in handy 
um, to be able to have some things that are, um, you know, going to be stored away and, and put away. The other thing that I did was um, I recently redid my inside of my closet. I'd been dragging around all of this modular bookcase furniture for the last 30 years, and I decided, okay, now I've got to get serious, and I'm going to really put in a, a nice closet system. And so I put in the Alpha system by the that you can get at the container store. Yep. And what I liked about that system was that if I move, that whole basket system can move with me. It's not permanently mounted in the closet. Yeah. Um, the other thing was, is I gave them measurements and then I also told them what I was wanting to store and they designed the CAD drawing, the whole layout of the closet. And I limited myself to, I think it's 12, I think it's 12 baskets, 12, no, maybe 16. And I decided, okay, because I had to store other things. I have my camera equipment and I've got my um, UFOs and my works in project and I've got some of my personal business thing that I had. So it wasn't just a fabric closet, but I decided, okay, I've got 16 baskets. That's going to have to house all the fabric I have. That was my playground area. And because I'm also a garment and a home deck maker, so about four of those are for home deck and garment and the rest are quilting. And if it, and so I was being really tough on myself. I went through all my fabric, laid it out, spent a couple of days with boxes on the floor. Every box was a different color. So let's say it's orange, it's all the orange fabric. Doesn't matter whether it's a fat quarter, whether it's a jelly roll, whether it was um, yardage, it was all the orange, then it was a box of blue, then there was a box of green. And I could just literally pull out stuff that I decided, I don't like this, I don't work in this anymore. Um, it's not my style and I pulled all that out and then I packed it all back into those those baskets and even now when I'm looking at a sale at something which is really tempting I'm looking and going okay do I really need any more how much room do I have in that basket yeah uh, that's and, that's that's such a good tip yeah it really is you're allowing yourself space also, it sounds like you're allowing yourself um, access to that um, yes. fabric by the way that you designed it. And, you know, sometimes it took me years to really get into the mindset of investing time and energy into an organized supply area. Like I would just use whatever I had, you know, That's what I did too. Or something yeah. like that. And once I invested and really planned my studio space, or excuse me, my storage space, then I was able, I respect it. Like I wanted to keep it organized. Like I, um, it sounds like you and I have kind of a similar uh, variation on a theme of like all the colors together and things like that. And um, it works for me. And if I don't have room for that fabric uh, that I want to bring in, I think hard, I either, you know, think hard about bringing it in to begin with, or I realize there's something in my stash that's got to go. I can't use all of this fabric. Um, and so that's really helped me as well. That's really a great tip. And also the vertical space, gosh, that's so underutilized in most people's um, sewing spaces. It, it is. And so what I've, what I've given up on display area, I've made up for with storage storage so yeah. that I can have the things that I would like in the space um, and not fill it with lots and lots of quilts or other kinds of decorative things. Right. Um, and the other thing with storing the fabric is for years, I did the stack method. Mm -hmm. you, know, like you see bookcases and that worked really well. But after a while, it got to be really cumbersome. I'm trying to pull out a particular fabric and it would fall over and then I'd have to- At the bottom stack. of the stack, yeah. And yeah. so what I went, went with with the baskets is that they are stacked, but they're stacked sort of like uh, like patterns in a pattern drawer when you go to this, uh, like yeah. your Blind and McCall's pattern and they're stacked that way. So I yeah. still can see the edge of the fabric and I can see what it is but they're easy to get. They're not falling down as I'm pulling out one or right. two or three. Yeah, and, no, I um, think that's really clever. 
yeah that, that has worked well as well but for those people that are having more fabric than let's say like where they're limiting themselves like you and i are um there are things that you can do like the um, by annie makes the pattern called uh room with a view and it is a basically a box with a zipper and a clear vinyl screen so that you could let's say you have lots of christmas fabric that or holiday whatever you know collection it is and you don't use that all the time you only need it for those times when you want to make something for that holiday and so you still want to keep that but you don't want to keep it in a plastic bag or stash it under uh something so you still want to be able to see it and so this way you can use maybe some of the fabric you're not in love with but you have lots of it you could make these storage cubes that zip up that would hold the collection of what it is that you want and because it has a window on it you can still see what's inside yeah. and that's the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is if you put it in a closet way in the back in the dark you can't see what's in there so you know you totally forget about it but if you at least have you know some way to be able to look at it whether it is yeah. a container um containers are great but you want to um let air get access to the fabric yeah. so ideally you want something that's um that's not going to off gas uh, drill a couple of holes in the side of the container just so that there's some airflow if that's the method that you're able to have uh, or like I said make something of your own uh, and that way you can have them accessible and you can still maybe see the what's in there or put a giant label on it you know it's Christmas it's Halloween it's you know whatever it is so that you know when you're looking around even if it's in the depths of your closet you know what that is yeah you know what it looks make like. Make the label big because yeah. I don't know about you, but my eyesight, I need I need big font. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Bigger, better. Yep. Yeah, yes. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, and so what about like um, you know, any tips for storing like embroidery threads or you know, other miscellaneous supplies that uh quilters and and embroiderers use but you know i know for me i can't store anything uh out in open storage like my thread is in a drawer yeah. uh first of all i don't this is the dustiest place i've ever lived in santa fe i don't <laughs> like to dust so um it eliminates that but my fabric is in closed storage i can't see it i have a little piece of fabric in the front that gives me just enough information to know what's inside of okay. that but i can't things uh not only accumulate a lot of dust here but they fade so i can't uh the you know we're our elevation i think is six thousand feet um and the sun is very strong. So, um, and which works great for me to not have um, visible storage because I don't like visual clutter. But some people I know really do like um, to be able to see what they have, whether it's like in a plastic bin, like you said. So I love the tip you have about drilling holes because I come from an apparel uh textile background and fabric needs to breathe it will degrade over time fat thread when it sits in the sun every day it will degrade over time and um i think that time goes by quickly we don't realize how little time in the span of a lifetime it takes for that to start happening to those materials so i like that idea of just letting letting stuff breathe but what about for the like embroidery threads and yeah and um like what i do is um because for a long time i was like you my workspace was out in the open or i was sharing it and so i simple this was years ago those craft boxes that you can find at the craft stores they come in all these decorative patterns and they're magnetic the lid closes and so you can literally stack two or three of those on a side table with a, a in your living room and no one's going to be the wiser but then one box could be all your silk 
threads. Another one can be all your wool ones. Um, that's worked for me for a long time. Other people I know enjoy having things in um, their acid-free kinds of containers where the, the threads you wrap around a little uh, spool um, and then you have it labeled and you can stack them in there. And then they are, uh, again, away from the light, away from dust. Um, in my household, it is dust as well, but I live with fur friends. And so uh, they're in, in a little ball of yarn or embroidery floss is a really fun thing to play away. with. So uh, <laughs> that's the other reason that I put things away is um, that they are just, they're just too handy as, as toys. Yeah. Um, there's also a number of different places that you can look for different kinds of little containers, you know, whatever it is that you prefer. Some people like a sort of a little mini filing cabinet, you know, that you can pull the drawers open and you've got your various threads and embroidery or maybe your hoops in there. Um, but I, I agree, having a lot of that out, uh, unless you're really, really using it, like for example, if you're someone like um, uh, Judith Baker Montano, who works in all kinds of fiber. Her system works for her because I think she's constantly working with it. Mm -hmm. She actually has a pegboard that she has uh, used and it has wooden pegs and she keeps her floss and her ribbons on these metal rings and then just hangs it exactly. on the pegboard, but she's living with it and she is constantly using it. So I think you really need to evaluate, are you doing embroidery every day or every week, or is it sort of, well, I do it uh, every six months or so when there's a new project, you kind of have to balance uh, yeah. how much are you using that? And do you want it out? Um, yeah. Because like you said, having dust and light affect it, or would it be better to have it in um, you know, a little drawer, um, some kind of container where you can keep it um, safe and away from bugs and kitties and dogs and all right. that sort of thing. Yeah. I have a fur friend too. Yeah. And, um, he loves, you know, all that stuff. Wow. And I was also going to say this rolling cart from the container store mm -hmm. that I have here. I think that, um, this is such a good idea. If somebody is in a shared space, um, I'll kind of roll it out, but it's, these are so inexpensive at the container store and they have like a top that comes off. Oh, nice. I've seen people actually turn this top. It's just like a laminate top into an ironing surface, which is pretty cool. You could just, yeah. it. and then you've got, you know, all your stuff. It has kind of a fine mesh bottom. So things get air. And then what I do again, because I don't like dust is um, I just have these little um, Sasha Co sampler pieces of fabric that are just kind of simple, but pretty that um, I stitched during pandemic watching movies. And I just keep those on there and then you just slide it out of the way. But, um, you know, stuff like that also can help store you know, all kinds of things that you use every day or things that you need to put away at the end of the day and not see if you're in a... Right, right. A the, other, the other thought is that, and this is sort of diverging a little bit from that, is that over the space of years, your needs regarding lots of tools and things also changes. So uh, one of the examples I always talk about in my lectures is do you really need six of the exact same size and type ruler? Yeah. Uh, I was, when I was clearing out in my studio, I found the very first ruler that I bought in 1986 when I was pregnant with my first son and we were living overseas and this is the only thing that was available and I bought it to make a quilt for him. And I still had that ruler and I thought, why in the world am I holding on to it? Well, now it's an example for my lecture, but right. at the time I thought, you know, it's like your favorite mug in your cabinet. You may have 25 mugs in there, guaranteed the ones that you use are right up front. Right They're up the ones front. that fit nice in your hand. You like the way the coffee or the tea stays hot. Um, it's your- Or you're pulling it out of the dishwasher every day, yeah. Yeah, 
And all those other ones are lovely. They're still lovely and you like them. That's why you have them. Right. But the same thing happens with rulers is that's just an example here is that you bought rulers over the years and it's not that those other ones are bad. It's just you found your favorite. It's the one you like the markings, you like the size, there's um, whatever it is. So why have seven of the same seven and a half inch ruler right. when you really are only going to use the one that's your favorite right now? And Absolutely. you can pass those other ones on to somebody else that maybe is a new maker and they don't have a budget for, you know, buying rulers. So pass those on to somebody else. And then that then clears out a lot more space to just have the rulers that you really use all the time. Yeah. And if you're not really sure about how many times you're using anything in particular, there's a really easy, simple way. It's a visual. You can get something like washi tape. Um, get it in a bright color, something you're going to see. And every time you use one of your tools, um, or when you use the tool, put a piece of washi tape on it. And you'll pretty soon, after about a month, or depending on how often you work, maybe it might take six months if you don't work a lot, you'll really visually see what is it that you're working with. Now, I'm not saying get rid of every pair of scissors you've ever owned, because there's some that you don't use a lot. But if you've got four or five of the same kind, which is the one you're going to? Yeah. Probably the one that's got that piece of tape on it. That's so that's a, just a simple way that you can kind of test yourself yeah. um, to see how much are you really using a lot of the tools that you have or the rulers or the, you know, rotary cutter, anything. Right. Like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I agree. That's a great tip. I love that. Um, well, Lila's book, I'm looking through the table of contents now. I mean, I've perused this um, several times already, but um, this book, Love Your Creative Space has such good I mean, I'm reading the chapters, like how to, you know, store your tools, how to store marking uh, supplies, um, setting up your space, lighting, cleaning up. That's another thing we didn't talk about. Let's touch on that for a minute. So are you a, at the end of a sewing day, are you a cleaner upper or um, how do you end your day? I am a, I am a cleaner upper at the end of the day. There are, there are those folks like cleaning it as soon as they get in there, but I usually am like, I want to get started. I don't want to spend 15 minutes or 20 minutes yeah. or what have you. So I prefer cleaning up. And really when I talk about cleaning up, I don't mean, for example, you're in the process of building this quilt top. You've done, let's say it's a bunch of applique. So you've got some books out, you've got your pattern, you've got the fabrics that, and the templates, and you've made all the appliques and you've attached them in some form, pin, glue, whatever your method is. And so when you come back the next day or the next time you have a chance, you're really just gonna be doing the stitching down of those appliques on that top. Yeah. So you're not gonna need the the reference books you may not even need the templates you may not need all that fabric that you had collected for this particular part so whatever you're not necessarily going to use the next time you come back that's what i'm saying you should put away i don't mean you need to put the whole project away, away. yeah just what you're not going to use because right. what happens and like we already talked about this is that you set it aside on some flat surface and then several weeks go by and then in my case maybe two or three weeks and then next thing I know, I've got, you know, my cat sitting on it. And that's now yeah. become the new cat bit. Yes. And, um, and so 15 minutes, you can pick up things like scraps that have on, fallen on the floor, maybe drop some pins, um, any of that other kind of extraneous stuff yeah. that will just keep things a little bit more orderly. If you've been, maybe you've been working at your desk <clears throat> and you've been doing a bunch of designing and writing and what have you, just, you know, put the pencils away, put away the extra paper, whatever, so that when you come back, it's a nice clean place for you to start continuing on more designing, more drafting, whatever it is. Yeah, um, oftentimes people don't realize, get yourself a cheap kitchen timer, 15 minutes. Yes. You can do a whole lot in 15 minutes. Refold a couple of uh, fat quarters that you decided you didn't want to use, put them back in the, in the bin. Yeah. Um, rather than they're sitting around. So that's that's um, something I really do stress. And then uh, definitely because there's a lot of fiber blowing around in the room, uh, I would say take time at least once a month 
especially if you're quilting a lot or doing a lot of cutting, <clears throat> run the vacuum because there's a lot of that stuff that's around. And um, the other thing I would say is when, especially now that we're going back to retreats and classes, we may be taking that iron, we're taking that machine, plugging in, unplugging it, check all that kind of stuff too, so that it's all still really working well. And then maybe something isn't uh, like the cord isn't starting to fray or anything of that sort. Yeah. I'm a firm believer in cleaning my sewing machine out um, between projects. I just sat here yesterday and cleaned the inside for like 20 minutes. Okay. Now that's where I'm, I have to really work at that. I have well, to say, you know what? I have a video on how I do it. It's, it's yeah. pretty simple, but I'll link to it on this so that we can, um, that, would be, see it. that would be great. But I love, um, I love what you said because, you know, my kids and I, at the end of the day, when they were little, we would have um, a 10 minute tidy and everybody had to like run around, pick up the books they'd had all over the floor, put them back on the bookshelf, you know, just little things like that made such a difference um, for everybody's um, just state of mind for the rest of the day, you know? And then sometimes um, I think it's just, how you respect your space. We expect and hope so much for these creative spaces, whatever they are that we're working in. You know, it, it's it's our own space. And I think that taking the time to really be thoughtful about um, what we bring in and how we store it and mm -hmm. um, how we use it and you know just remember that you know sometimes we have to pass things on and it's okay you know um i was talking to a woman years ago and she said you know when i see a piece of needlework finished needlework at, at the thrift store i just have to buy it i feel like you know a little, they call it little orphaned needlework and, but she never used it. And so I thought, you know, is it better to buy it, spend the money on it and just put it away? Or is it better to either buy it and gift it to somebody who would like to use it or buy or not buy it and let somebody else find it and use it? And that really changed the way I shopped for vintage fabric at thrift stores and things. If I I try not to just buy it for the sake of owning it because, you know, especially with the big move that we did, it's like everything I look at acquiring now, I'm like, I'm going to have to clean it. I'm going to have to find a place to put it. Um, am, am I going to need easy access to it? Or is it something that, you know, I may only need like once every couple of months or something like that. But um these are all like such good tips to just think about and maybe, um, you know, like you said, set a day on the calendar mm -hmm. and just say today, I'm going to pull out all that fabric and I'm going to take a really critically hard look at it. Right. And I would ideally choose a time on the calendar where there's nothing going on. It's not yeah. around the big holiday or lots of people coming over. And so that you can just, you know, kind of focus on that and, and really work on that area that's really bothering you most. When you walk in the room, that's the one you look at and you go, oh man, you know, yeah. I don't really want to mess with all of it. That's the area that you need to start with. And, yeah. um, and just do that bit because it will, A, it will make you feel really good because you're like, oh, I've tackled that. And then it might even give you that additional energy to say, okay, well, I've done the closet. Now maybe next week I'll do- That's so great, table. yeah. Yeah, and, and work on that. Or, and you just sort of slowly work your way around. Yeah. Um, but then also with that in mind is that um, have a plan of where this stuff is gonna go. Yeah. So do that before you say, okay, next Wednesday, I'm gonna start clearing out the closet. Well, where is that gonna go? Is that gonna, are you giving that to the put and take table? Are you sending it off to- your local charity that does um, like sewing lessons or quilting right. lessons. Um, have, a, have that already in place and then maybe have some boxes or bags that are labeled for that. So yeah. that as you're clearing stuff out, it goes in that box or bag and then 
you put it in the back of the car. Because once yeah. you've got it in the back of the car, you close that door and for a minute it hurts. Yeah. And then you walk away and then it might be in your mind for a little bit, but then hopefully there's that joy of you've, you coming back into your room and realizing, oh, look, now I've got some space. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing to think about is that this may not be making you that excited anymore, mm -hmm. but guess who's getting it at the put and take table and is going to be so excited because that's something yeah. that they're looking for. They're going to be thrilled with re receiving that. It's not the yeah. same as setting it out on the side of the road for the garbage men. Right. That's a different feeling. Like, okay, it's yeah. out of my life. Um, so yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, it really can be a positive thing letting some of this go. Yeah, it's great. Well, Lilo, thank you so much for this. I'm kind of inspired. You know, my studio is pretty clean, but now I'm sure there's something that I can tidy up in here or go through because it's a continuous process. You don't do it once and then it's done. Um, it, absolutely. It is an ever moving fluid kind of space. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking maybe I need to go through my quilting rollers. Oh, there's several. There's several. Um, there's like my favorites. And then there's the ones that I have wonky measurements on them. And I'm like, this is really nothing more than just a straight edge. And I have plenty of those. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, you can get a link to Lilo's book, Love Your Creative Space. You guys, this is a resource that you will want to um, look through time and time again. I mean, it's just got so many good ideas and it's not just for quilters. It's for whatever sort of creative pursuit um, your, your own sewing space um, allows you to do. So thank you, Lilo. And um, I hope we can uh, have you back on one of these days. Yeah, and just in case anybody uh, is interested, um, I will be giving two lectures at Houston this year at Quilt Festival. So that is sort of a companion to the book. It doesn't replace the book, uh, but it's a longer uh, presentation, I really focused on organizing your space, how to kind of get started. And then the other one is on adapting, which is another thing that uh, a lot of us are doing. We're changed, as you did, you and I did. We've changed our studio. We've adapted it to where we are in our lives right now. So um, definitely can check that out if you're interested. So that's Quilt Festival, which yeah. is coming up soon, right? What are the dates for Quilt Festival? Well, I will be, Quilt Festival will be taking place the 2nd of November through the 6th. Okay. And I have a lecture on Thursday the 3rd and Friday the 4th. Okay. So, so I'll, I'll uh, put that in our notes too. Yeah. That's so the good. third. Yeah, thank you. Okay. The so third for, is. For oh. those of you that are at Quilt Festival, get the book first. Yes. And then Lilo will give you some um, ways to supplement it um, in your talks. That's great. Yeah. Thank you Thanks very much so for much. having me. It's been great yeah. fun. Yeah. Thanks, Lilo. Mm -hmm.